when I first got out of college, uh, I took a job working for uh, a bank as a financial advisor. And uh, in order to like train or start that job, I don't know if it was like some type of part of their initiation process or something they wanted to do, but they, they sent me to a branch that was inside of a mire. Now, if you've never been to mire, just think a little tiny bit classier than Walmart. If you've gotten to Target, you went too far. And like there you could buy groceries and like everything else under the sun. Uh, And then on the outside of the checkout was like a row of like little tiny like kiosk type stores, right? Which included the bank that they sent me to to train in. And so uh, I'm like 22, 23 years old. I was, I, I think I was engaged at the time. So not even married, not like yet into family stage of life. Uh, watching these primarily, like I'm working there during the daytime, so I'm watching these primarily moms with little kids frequently walking through the checkout lanes, uh, trying to like keep their kids contained into that jail cell cart thing, you know, uh, while their kids are also trying to reach out to all of those, like, things, right, all the candy bars that are on both sides of them in the aisle as they wait in line, like, I don't know whose satanic idea that is, but, like, that's a, what a treasure, right, like, oh, let's put all of the bright colored candy right here when the moms are waiting, and, like, I specifically remember couple weeks in, one of the things that we were instructed to do is if there was like a lot of downtime in the branch and you didn't do anything, you just, you go stand out in front of the branch and you could greet people as they went by, say hi to them, whatever, you know, kind of watch them. And so I I remember so vividly myself and one of the other bankers who was, she was a a single mom, had three three or four kids. and uh, We're standing out here watching these lines in the checkout and And one of the lines in particular has a young child in this line who is just having a day, right? Like just just a little bit rough. And uh, like I think there were like chicken nuggets flying around at some point. And like there's there's kind of a lot of crying, a lot of whining, and a lot of a little bit of like conversation, negotiating. It's kind of getting escalating to a point of like this, this mom's trying to figure out both discipline and checkout and groceries and like you just leave your groceries and and you can tell there's a lot of stress there and I remember as a naive like 21, 22 year old without any kids looking at this uh, single mom and and saying the words that should never ever be said. Uh, Just trust me, never should be said. My kids won't act like that. (laughs) Such a liar. Yes, they will. Yes, they will. You just, you just don't know when, right? Like, and so um, I tell you that story because whether you're in the life stage that hasn't yet gotten to the point that you're trying to manage uh, kids that are a little chaotic and sometimes uh, a little hard to handle during a time like this, uh, I want you to be patient. And And then the the second iteration of that same statement kind of comes from uh, a generation past mine who goes, my kids didn't act like that. I don't believe you. I just just don't, okay? I just think you've romanticized the past. Even if you believe yourselves, right? I can say this because I'm right there, but like you raised my generation, we're not exactly knocking it out of the park. So maybe you didn't do it right, okay? I just... Just saying, okay, so, so in that, that's, that's an appeal and a plea. Let's be patient during this time. One of the really glorious and beautiful things about a weekend like this is we are a church filled with young people. And so that's, that's noise and distraction sometimes. It's a little bit of chaos, right? Yeah, praise the Lord for that. And so we don't want to be just people that are a generation away from not existing anymore, right? Uh, we, we love the idea that we're training up young people in the way of the Lord, and so uh, that includes, I didn't, hey, I, didn't, I, see, I see some of you kind of smiling like you're in that group. I didn't define it, okay, you know, that could be me. I get hit by a car on the, well, I can't, I'm going to walk home, but, but you know, it happens, right? So in that, uh, what, a, what a great and glorious thing. Praise the Lord that we're able to do that. So I want to I pray with us and then uh, spend some time worshiping the Lord together in His Word. All right, Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for uh, so many of our uh, people, right? the, the church body gathered together to worship 
your name. I pray that as we study your word this morning, as we look at what a church is meant to look like, what it's meant to be led like, that it would be an opportunity for us to bring greater glory, greater praise, greater magnifying of who you are in all things. And so help us with that, discern that well for us as we worship together. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you have a Bible, you can grab it. You go with me to the book of Titus. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab that black one in the pew in front of you. Uh, It's page 1193 in that Bible, the book of Titus. Uh, If you're not someone who owns a Bible of your own, once you get done today, take that black one with you. We would love to give that to you as a gift. We feel like it's really valuable. Uh, In this Here's what we're going to do. Let me kind of map out the the process for the next few weeks. We um, decided going into this summer that we would really utilize our time over the summer months to talk about some foundational things that we believed were important to who we are as a church and what it means to be a part of God's people. Now, now we've always, uh, over the last several years, really expressed that what it means to be God's church on mission is that we would be a people who, who really understand what is called the Great Commission. That's the very end of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus has resurrected from the dead, and he looks at his disciples, and the very last thing that he says to them, according to Matthew's Gospel, is all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. In other words, I'm in charge, you do what I say. And then what do I say? Well, he, he goes on to say this. Go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And so we express that, we just kind of simplify that into three words, that we exist to make disciples by going into all of the world, that that it would be a proactive thing. We exist to make disciples by gathering with the saints. That's what he's talking about when he talks about baptizing, that the church is meant to be together, gathering people, baptizing people, and then teaching people. And we say that it includes growing then in our faith, that, that you who know Christ are meant to grow in your sanctification, in your maturity in Christ. And so over the summer, we began uh, through series that we talked specifically about what it looks like to be a people who would go into all the world, that we would be a people who would talk about Jesus. We would be a people who are not holding our faith as some inward private thing, but rather that if you were convinced this indeed is true, that the only way to really love others would be to, with wisdom, with love, with concern, right? But, but in that, that we would boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus. And then uh, we moved on from that and talked specifically about what it looks like to grow in your faith and, and really in one specific segment, which was reading the Scriptures, that, that we're meant to be a people who would spend time really consistently in the Scriptures, reading, studying, knowing the Bible. And so then we're finishing up uh, over the next three weeks with that middle segment that, that we express in the word gather, which is really about what the church is. And so um, we got asked, we do, we do Wednesday nights, this is a free plug, we got one more Wednesday night, regular Wednesday night this summer, coming up this Wednesday, six o'clock, we eat a ton of food, a lot of food, some really good, some mediocre. Again, I'm not looking at anybody, right? I just, no, most people make pretty good food. I've, I get... This is a little, little rabbit trail, but I get like frustrated with Whitney because the best food that she makes, she makes for Wednesday night. And I'm like, what about, I don't even get to eat that food. She's like, well, I'm not going to make something that I'm not sure tastes good for all the people. Like that would be embarrassing, right? So, so know that it's, it's good food. Uh, we sit down, we eat, and then we walk through the Bible, we're teaching, and, and we always sort of begin that time with some opportunity for questions. And so this past Wednesday, Sharon Davis uh, raised her hand and said, hey, what is a healthy church? Right, that's a good question. Amen? What's a healthy church? And, and here's what, uh, I, I kind of mentioned this on Wednesday, and then I spent the next several days kind of thinking through this and, and trying to think specifically about how a variety of Christians might answer that question. My suspicion is that you would get 
a whole host of answers. I even, I thought about bringing out like a whiteboard today and just letting you guys throw out answers. Um, But if you have been there on Wednesdays, you know I'm a little insecure about spelling in front of all of you, and so I wasn't willing to do that. Um, And what what I really, as I was thinking about it, thought is most of us, would give answers that start to categorically fall into a few different areas. And typically, it's not based on what we've seen among healthy churches, but it's based on, especially if you grew up in the church environment, it's based on your experience with unhealthy churches. Amen? And so, so you might be inclined to say, okay, a healthy church is a church that has a good impact on its community around it, right? And, and typically that comes from, well, yeah, I grew up in this church and like nobody ever did anything and you just kind of checked in and checked out on Sunday and they never really cared for anybody that was around them or anything that was going on and it was pretty stagnant, it was pretty dead. So I know that a healthy church would be one that would actually care about the people that it exists to reach and to connect with, Amen. Or you might, you might be inclined to say a healthy church is a church that is filled with people who really love and care for and uh, work to be in good fellowship and relationship with one another, right? Typically, that comes from, hey, I've been in a church that in fought and split. Amen? Come on, we're just being honest. It's just us, right? That, that typically means I was in a church and I had to deal with, and then you've got a name there that you wouldn't say out loud, but you know that it's this person, and you're like, I just, oh, every week that I was there, I just couldn't even get along with this person, or I couldn't deal with it. And so, so I think a healthy church is where I come, and like the people actually care about each other. Amen? Or, or you might say, a healthy church is a church where the leadership is actually spiritually mature, actually interested in following God's word or actually uh, looking at the scriptures with us. Because chances are that means at some point you were a part of a church where the leadership structure was built on some type of power dynamic or some long-standing person or family that had been there or some pastor who was uh, manipulating or using the pulpit for their own personal gain. And so out of that bad experience, you're going, a healthy church is a church that doesn't look like that. So, so then here's, here's my uh, intention in all of this. Uh, we open up to the book of Titus, and what you're going to find is that in those exact same categories, Paul, the apostle, is writing to Titus, a pastor of a church and kind of church leader there, uh, what it looks like to make or to be a part of healthy churches. And, and the way he's going to do it is he's going to address what church leadership looks like, And then he's going to address how a congregation should interact with one another, what we're supposed to be like with one another. And then he's going to finish with what that looks like for us in the community. What does it mean going out? How does the church work itself out? And so what an encouraging thing that 2,000 years ago, the challenges that you and I probably have, if we have any church experience at all, are the same things that the very early church is dealing with and navigating. And God doesn't just leave us to figure it out, but that he gives us and instructs us as to what that would be like. And so Titus, we're going to work through Titus 1 today for just a few minutes and kind of talk about the church in particular, starting with what does a church look like when it has godly, biblical leadership? What does that mean? What is church leadership supposed to look like? All right, so as we uh, read, let me, let me give you a first couple of verses and start to introduce this, and then we'll uh, pause, take a little background about what Titus is as a book in the New Testament, and then we'll start to kind of just lay out some of the things that Paul is going to note as godly church leadership. Paul, this is verse 1, a bondservant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God, and the knowledge of the truth which is according to to godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago, but at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Savior. All right, so pause here. 
here's what we learn about this. Uh, and, and there's some other things in here we'll come back to in a second. But let me just give you the background. Paul uh, is an early apostle in the church. In fact, uh, if you read the book of Acts, what you're going to find is coming into Acts chapter 7, 8, and 9, uh, Paul's introduced to us. At that time, he's actually named Saul. Uh, his life is dramatically changed. He begins as somebody who's really against Christianity, zealous to get rid of Christians as a whole, uh, and as he is traveling from one city to the next to do that very thing, God knocks him down, blinds him, saves him, and out of this he becomes someone who will now work for the rest of his life to declare the good news of Jesus in and around all of the known world from that point forward. And so his life after that is really consisting of him traveling from city to city to city, proclaiming the gospel and planting or starting new churches. That's, that's what he does. He brings a whole bunch of people along with them, disciples them along the way, typically uh, guys that are younger than him, and it includes a young man named Titus. Now Titus travels with Paul for some period of time, and then Paul leaves Titus on an island called Crete. Now, we're going to find out in just a little bit that that island is filled with people who uh, wouldn't be described in the greatest of manner. Uh, in fact, he's going to use words like lazy and gluttonous, people that aren't really that well received. But in and among the island of Crete, Paul has, with Titus and others, now established, planted some churches in the area. The gospel has been declared in that area, and then Paul heads out. Now, there's some controversy about if he's kind of, this is writing in a time that he's on his own, or if he's in prison, and uh, really, it's, it's not all that important. Here's what you need to know. Paul has left Titus there to oversee the church and to put some structure in place in the church congregations in Crete. And so, uh, Titus is now given this task. Verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. So, so here's the purpose, that Titus would be someone who is left behind in Crete for the purpose of establishing the church. And so out of this purpose, here's, here's what I want to ask. What is a church leadership look like? If that's the goal that Titus has been given, according to Paul, and that's the writing, right? That the reason is that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city. What does that look like? And, and so I come up with, with five things. I think we're going to put them up on the screen as we go through them, but I just want to just want to mention each one of them and then talk about them for a minute or two. And then we'll get done. We'll try to get done a little quick with the kids in here. But first of all, Note this, before he even gets to the idea that, that there's a purpose in Crete, Paul introduces the letter to Titus, a guy that he's been hanging out with, a guy that he's close with, a guy that he knows well and trusts well with deep-rooted theology of the gospel. So here, here's what I, I want you to see in these first few verses. That a healthy church recognizes first and foremost the grace of God in Jesus Christ, our Savior, as its primary authority. Look at, look at how he says it, right? That Paul is writing this, is back in verse 1, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God, and the knowledge of the truth, which is in accordance to godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God promised long ago, and, and then in that, entrusted to Paul, down in verse 3, to, according to the commandment of God our Savior. To Titus, verse 4, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ. And then he uses this phrase, our Savior. That first and foremost, Paul wants to remind Titus and then is going to kind of use this language in and throughout the rest of the letter that ultimately what it looks like to set in order a church that would be a godly church is a church that has a good conception of the grace and hope according to Jesus Christ. It would be a church that's foundation, that's primary, that's first and foremost oriented around the gospel. This is, this is why Paul, when he, he talks about the church according to Ephesus, as he's writing a letter to them, he's going to talk about the church, us, as the body of 
of Christ. And then he's going to talk about Jesus being the head, the one that controls it, the one that ultimately sits above and beyond what it exists to obey, what it exists to serve, what it exists for the function of. And so he's going to remind Titus of the same thing, that it doesn't, doesn't matter how, how great a structure your church has. It doesn't matter how well organized it is. It doesn't matter how good the preaching is or how good the music is. It doesn't matter how nice you are to one another or how well things come together if, first and foremost, we don't recognize that our hope is in Jesus Christ, our Savior, and that all of it exists to glorify the One who, through grace, has saved you. That that ultimately, that first and foremost, a healthy church is one that recognizes Jesus above all else. Amen? Now, now look at what he says next, right? He goes down to verse 5, and he's very specific about what his point is in this. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains. And then he says this, and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Now, the second thing then is that a healthy church in leadership is led by elders. Now, a couple, couple things about this word. First of all, Paul's uh, always going to use this word in the plural sense in a church, which means that when we talk about an elder, which the word is also synonymous, uh, depending on how you want to translate it. Some, some of your Bibles might have the translation bishop, or a lot of them will have the translation overseer. Same word, somebody who is ultimately leading through uh, spiritual leadership and guidance, and it's always plural, which means that it's not me alone, right? That, that I'm not in charge of this thing. I don't, I don't run this show independently. In fact, any church that's going to have one singular person who is uh, noting that they are in, in control, in charge, making the decisions, probably not going to be a long-lasting, healthy church. It's just going to run into issues. And so Paul knows this. Even there in Crete, new churches, small churches, churches getting started, are defining them by appointing elders, plural. Some, some men that would be in leadership in the context of the church. So healthy church has elders, has more than one of them. Let's look at what they're supposed to be like. Now, now he goes on to list like 13, 14, maybe depending on how you count it, characteristics of an elder. Watch, watch this, starting in verse 6. If any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion, for the overseer, or the elder, right, must be above reproach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, not fond of sordid gain, but hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, self-controlled. So, so let me just pause here and note this, right? That elders and overseers are qualified to serve in that role, first and foremost, based on character. If, if you note know the list that is just there, that's a list not of remarkable skill set, but it's a list regarding the character of an individual. Now, let's just kind of get this out in the open. I, I don't fit all those characteristics perfectly. You don't have to be that agreeable, all right? Let's, you know, maybe you could question it a little bit. No, you don't need to, right? Uh, here's, the, here's the thing, though. I say this with more joy, neither do you, right? None of you, right? There, there's only one human being that ever walked the earth that fit all of those characteristics, and he rose from the dead three days later, right? And so in this, you and I recognize that this Paul is not uh, noting this as an uh, understanding or a standard of perfection, but of a standing in character. Right? And so, uh, certainly, I wouldn't describe myself nor uh, any of our other elders as men who have been self-controlled in every moment, in every aspect of our life, right? Like, I drive on the freeway too, okay? So I've had times where it's like, ah! Right? No, you're the ones that I'm doing that towards then if you don't understand that, right? Like, 
And so, so in that, right, you, you have these moves. But what he's, what he's noting is that you would look at someone and go, that's, that's a characteristic, that's an attribute of who this person is, that it's somebody that can be trusted. Now let me, let me just hone in on a couple of them because I think you're going to watch how these play themselves out in the opposition to what somebody might be considered who is uh, qualified by character to be an elder. First, he says that they're, they're not somebody who would be accused of dissipation. If you don't know what that word means, it's a, it's a court term uh, as we use it in our culture now. And somebody that lives a dissipated lifestyle would be somebody who uh, has like given themselves over to alcohol abuse or substance abuse or gambling or neglect of family, those kind of things that are not just singular in their issue, but somebody who has recklessly used their life in a way that we would as a society say, well, that's, that's a repetitive use of foolishness in your life, right? Not momentary slip-ups, but that they've been accused as somebody who is constantly being reckless or neglect or self-centered in their life, right? And, and so you see that when he notes this, he's, he's kind of noting other characteristics that connect to this, right? He says that they would be a husband of one wife and that they would have children who believe that they're managing their household in such a way that is good for them. They're not addicted to wine, right? That, that there's a recognition that they have some balance and some self-control in their life, in the things that we would see culturally as it's really important to us, right? And so uh, not accused of dissipation. Then he, then he says this other one that again, like I just, I wanted to pick out the words that I thought, I bet you you need a dictionary to know what these mean, right? He says, not pugnacious, right? Here's what, uh, a pugnacious person is somebody who is uh, quick to argue or quick to quarrel or fight. So in other words, an elder is, is not somebody who is constantly at war with you over every word you speak. It's not somebody who is naturally argumentative, naturally looking to battle you in all things. Uh, it's, you know, the other things that he says like this, right? Somebody who's not quick-tempered or somebody who is sensible and self-controlled, not rebellious. Now, the interesting thing about that is we know that somebody who's going to lead others has to stand with conviction at times, right? And so uh, not pugnacious doesn't mean that it's somebody who's a complete pushover or who is completely uh, unwilling to have any conviction about any given thing, but rather that it's somebody who recognizes what battles are worth fighting, amen? Let's go back to the parenting thing for a second, right? Um, 10, 8, and 6. And so, like, I feel like when I go home, there is, like, constantly this, like, little chess match that is going on between me and my kids. And, like, each progressive year, they get better at the game. And so, at some point, like, I'm just going to start losing all of these battles. But, but you're trying to figure out when is it a time to kind of press Right? And, and, and when they kind of are a little hesitant or a little whiny or a little slow to obedience or, or something isn't really happening, when do I go, nope, right now, we're making sure this happens? And, and when are the times where you kind of take your foot off the gas and go, okay, you know what, let's, let's discuss it with them, let's kind of reorient this, let's, let's move this into a different direction, we can kind of keep the peace and keep, keep it moving, right? Amen? I you didn't notice, I parented alone this weekend, just the boy, right? So it's like a third of the, well, it's like a half of the difficulty because he's, he's special in that way. Uh, but, but in that, right, like there's all these, all these questions, all these suggestions, all these instructions, and then there's constantly this idea of like, okay, as, as you want to do something other than what I want you to do, am I going to make you do what I want you to do, or, or am I going to not quarrel with you about this? Am I going to kind of give you a little bit of freedom to let you figure that out on your own, right? That this is what Paul's noting in an elder, is that it's somebody who wouldn't be so quick to quarrel, so quick to fight, so quick to be argumentative, but rather is in wisdom, in discernment, trying to figure out what it looks like to lead people in a way of godliness. And, the, and then the last thing, uh, the other one I want to point out is he notes that an elder would be God's steward, 
above reproach as God's steward, right? Uh, it's not self-willed, love what is good. That an elder would be somebody who recognizes that the church belongs to the head, which is Christ. It doesn't belong to them who stand in the stewardship of it, right? That, that you uh, have elders in your congregation now that exist to recognize that we are guiding, stewarding, entrusted with some leadership, some wisdom, some decision making about what the church looks like, but that it's not my church. It's not their church any more than it's your church. Who does the church belong to? Yeah, it's God's church. It's we're his body, we exist to serve him, we exist to glorify him, and so it has stewards in that, right? And so he uses this phrase, as God's steward. Now, I think, I, I, just, if, if you're like a definition person, here's how I wrote it down. Elders are men who exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. They have a demeanor that displays patience with conviction and a recognition of, that they serve as a steward of Christ's church. I think about that again, right? That's, that's surmising those three sort of thematic ideas, that they're men who exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, have a demeanor that displays patience with conviction, and a recognition that they serve as stewards of Christ's church, not our church. And, but then he keeps going. So, so note those three things in particular, and watch how he finishes this up. Right? Verse 9, he says, they also would be holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and refuse those who contradict it. So, so the fourth thing is that an elder would be somebody who can exhort sound doctrine and can refute those who contradict sound doctrine, that the church would be made up of people who recognize that doctrine is important, that, that what we teach is ultimately the centerpiece of who we are. So, so let, me, let me help you with how this plays out in our church and whether or not we have it, per well, we don't have it, I don't, I don't say whether or not we have it perfect, we don't have it perfect, but, but here's how we value and espouse this. Um, we have a board of elders here. That, that works together to kind of make spiritual leadership decisions, kind of set a course for us as a church, uh, and then the rest of us kind of fill in what that looks like to actually implement that course, and so that's kind of how we work together. And so among our board of elders, we meet uh, more or less every other week. And we, we meet in the mornings, and we sit down for an hour and a half, two hours, and, and talk through some things. And here's what's fascinating about that. Half of that time is spent praying and studying the Bible together. And so, so we sit down, and before we ever talk about what's coming up on the calendar, or what bills do we have, or what do we want to do about this thing or that thing, we spend a good amount of time opening our meetings in prayer, we close our meetings in prayer, but then we grab a piece of scripture, work through uh, some literature kind of endorsing or helping us or interpreting that scripture, and we just spend a lot of time talking about it and what that looks like and how that plays out in our own lives and how that plays out in the life of the church and what it should mean for us because ultimately, if we're really good at creating programs, but we can't exhort and refute doctrine, it doesn't mean much of anything. Right? We, we'd be we'd really good as a social club, but eventually you walk down that where you don't really value doctrine and you just come up with ideas and programs and things like that. Soon you find that the church has no distinction whatsoever from the Moose Lodge or the VFW or the Lions Club or your country club or any other social organization. I'm not saying social organizations are bad. I'm just saying they're distinct from what the church is, because the church is meant to be a body of believers existing for the glory of God. And so out of that, the church would be led by people who would, expo would exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who can contradict that. Now, the last thing that he notes in chapter 1 is the warning that there will be some who contradict it. Watch what he says. For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision 
who must be silenced because they're upsetting the whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. <laughs> this testimony is true. It's a bummer for the church in Crete. You wonder if Titus like read this to him at some point. It's like, oh, yeah, but forgot about that line. Uh, for this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their, de- by their deeds they deny Him, being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Here's, here's the warning he gives. You want to know what a healthy church is? It's a church that has healthy biblical church leadership at its head, at its uh, directive, and in that, that they would recognize, they'd be aware of, and they'd be concerned about the fact that there will be those who seek to corrupt that, seek to pervert that, whether it's intentional or unintentional. In the book of Acts, Paul's going to actually mention that some are going to come from outside of the church and some are going to rise up from within the church that seek to move people away from trusting in the gospel. And so then he lists what they're going to do and note, right? We said an elder is somebody who is going to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit, that their demeanor is going to match, their character is going to match what task they have at hand. And in verse 16, he says this about the people who are going to oppose that, that they're detestable, disobedient, and worthless because they profess to know God, but their deeds deny Him. It's the exact opposite, right? Not a people who would have a character of leadership, but who would have a profession of leadership whose character doesn't match. And and we said that they're not somebody who would be quick to quarrel or argumentative or find them as somebody who's always in a battle. And then he says this, uh, that you don't want to pay attention to the Jewish myths and the commandment of men who turn away from the truth. Here's, here's what was happening in Titus's day, is that there were some who were coming into the church and taking these sticking points of doctrine. In particular, he mentioned circumcision at that time. It was very important. And what they're doing is they're building out these elaborate arguments and finding ways to divide up the church among quarrels that weren't really sensible at all. And Paul says, don't, don't have anything to do with that. Don't, don't follow those myths. Don't follow men who would be contentious and argumentative by their nature. And then, and then not only that, right? we said that they would be sensible and that they, they would do this for the sake of being God's steward. And then he says, here's, here's the warning. This is, this is what you watch out for, that these men must be silenced because they're doing this, they're teaching for the sake of of sordid gain. That they're teaching because ultimately it exists to glorify self. It exists to give them something. It exists to provide them something. And so this is, this is the kind of last warning of what an unhealthy church leadership structure would look like. You got a guy standing up here whose main purpose is some type of self-oriented gain. It's not a healthy church. Uh, listen, you got a guy on TV, talking to you through that screen whose main purpose is something for himself that's not a healthy church. Right? That, that the most dangerous, perhaps, thing you could do is you could follow as an elder or a leader or a pastor, an overseer, whatever word you want to use, somebody whose primary interest is their gain, not yours. Amen? And here's the, here's the truth, right? My motivation is never 100%. Just like anything else, I don't, I don't claim to stand up here with perfection and go, oh, I'm, I'm always interested in you first laying down of self, never really interested in me at any given time. I, I want to be. Some of you are really hard to do that with. But here's the thing, right? If, if we're going to be a church that ultimately exists 
for the glory of God. It's going to be a church that has those serving in the office of elder who recognize that we together as a body are more important for the worship, for the glory, for the praise of his name than any one individual within that body is going to be. Amen? So let me, let me finish with this before we uh, go back to song. How do you then encourage godly leadership? For those of you who are not elders, uh, maybe you're not even members here, maybe you're just trying to figure out what it looks like to be in a church that is healthy, well, two things. One, you come back the next two weeks, all right? Because Paul starts with leadership and then he talks about what's the congregation supposed to look like? What do we encourage one another to be like in the congregation? And so just put it down, make a commitment the next two Sundays, be here, uh, listen to the word together and read it and be challenged by it as to how it looks. Two, because not all of you are going to do that, I just, just being real, right? Note this in a, in a really simplistic way how the author of Hebrews talks about what the church ought to do to encourage godly eldership and to encourage the elders to remain godly. Hebrews 13, this is how he finishes. That you would be a people who obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable. And this is, this is a good thing to think about, right? It doesn't say unprofitable for them. This would be unprofitable for you, right? If you fill our lives as elders with grief, what happens is we generally are not very kind to you, right? Like there's a self-oriented motivation. It, it comes back circular. It hinders the ability for us as a church to worship the Lord. And then he says this, and that you would pray for us, for we are sure that we have a good conscience desiring to conduct ourselves honorably in all things that you would desire to see leaders who are conducting themselves honorably, leading the church in the way of the Lord, and that you would pray for us that that would remain, that you would be consistent in that. And so uh, I want to I wanna close today. We're going to sing one more song in just a minute, but I want to close praying for our elders. And I know that's kind of a weird thing. I'm praying for myself among others, but uh, I, I want to pray for the, the men that are serving in the office of elder now, those who will at some point in the future, those who have at some point in the past, that God would continue to raise them up and hold them in a character, in a demeanor, in an attitude and attributes of men who are qualified to serve the headship of Christ in his church. So join me in prayer. Lord, we desire to be a church who would define ourselves among all things that uh, could be said about us as one that exists to glorify your name, that exists to rest in the hope of eternal life that is in the grace of God through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And, and so out of that, we know that that means you, you hold the authority over all things. You hold the authority over this church. And that if that's the case, we want to look at your word and your instruction to us and just follow it. And so uh, you instruct us that, that we would be a church who is led by those who are serving in the office of elder, overseer, and doing so for the sake of you as the head, the authority in the church. And so I pray that you would continue to Raise up, man, raise up leaders who are uh, all of the character traits that, that you mentioned there. Husband of one wife, children who are believers. Not pugnacious or rebellious men, not self-willed men, but those who understand that we are God's stewards. People that would love what is good, able to teach the sound doctrine and refute those who contradict it. Lord, I, I pray that you would continue to be fashioning hearts and souls in that way so that we could continue to be and, and grow to be a church that does praise and honor and glory by your name, 
by worshiping you according to the way that you desire and the way that you instruct us. We can't do it in our own power and our own ability. It has to be through the working of your spirit. So we ask you to help us, to empower us, lead us, and guide us as a church. We pray it in the precious name of Jesus.